My name is Adekunle Odir. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. So it's a pleasure. Oh, yeah, cool. So it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Um, before I start, I know my name is difficult, so I got an outline like that. If you guys want to say it with me, it's at a Kunle Oduye, so it's not that hard. Um, see, yeah, nice. See, everyone got it. Cool. Um, during my day job, I, I'm a product designer at NASDAQ. We work on web-based platforms for uh, investor relationship professionals. It sounds pretty complex, which it is, but... That's that. Um, I'm also one of the co-organizers for the Gotham SAS Meetup. Um, yeah, see? And also for SASConf. Um, so before I get into my talk, I want to talk about what I'm not going to talk about, which is if designers should know, learn how to code. This has, this has been a debate for the past two years. I was hearing a lot about it. But for me, I think there's a place for both coding and non-coding designers especially within our team, we have a 30-person team where some people are focused on the visuals, which is pretty good because they push the boundaries, while they got designers like me that lives in, within the boundaries and knows what it's capable of doing or not. What I also will be, uh, we're not speaking about is SAS basics. Hopefully, I, hopefully I'm assuming that everyone knows what are variables, makes sense, and so forth. So, hopefully I hope you guys will learn is that how SAS could introduce designers to programming concepts and also how it can make a better developer and designer. I know for me, it's definitely helping out just learning the ways of the web and how it works. And also, it seems kind of odd, but I think learning how to code actually made it better for me to communicate my ideas and and be able to collaborate with both designers, developers, and also stakeholders. So let me get into my story real quick. Um, I started out as a traditional print designer. I had no coding experience at all. Uh, I think the only cl class I had was like a Dreamweaver, and I hated it. Actually, I think I failed it, but that's, that was it. Um, so I came into head of an internship my first um, after I uh, left school. And I was doing basically promotional items and typical print stuff. So what had happened a couple of months down the line was I did a couple of mock-ups for a website. My boss was like, hey, do you want to code this site up? And I was like, not really. But I just, <laughs> I, I, got, I got promoted from intern to actual full-time. And I was like, I guess I got to do it, right? So I did it. And I was like, OK, challenge accepted. So it was actually a, a, a OK experience. The good, it was actually functional. You click on links, it actually went to the right pages. And that's about it. Because <laughs> if you actually look at it, I was very, I was very um, disorganized and redundant with my CSS. Like, my CSS was very wet. Kind of like what Leo was saying yesterday. Um, also, it took me a long time. It took me for the first project about six to eight weeks, which at the agency, it's a lot of time and money. Um, it was kind of funny because for that project, the client refused to pay a, um, the whole amount. So we had to give, it, give a discount for that, which now I'm losing money and I'm taking too much time. So I was like, oh man, I don't know. I don't know if I'm up to this. But I was like, it was great seeing my work come to life, and it was like, it gave me a good feeling. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was doing exactly like that. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was great for me seeing uh, my work come to life, and I was like, I think I, think I, I, think I might want to do this for a long haul. So this is where my code addiction start. My code addiction, not coke, but code <laughs> addiction. <laughs> So we went to the first stage of addiction, was experimentation. Um, I started, after having at least four or five projects under my belt, it was, I, I, knew, I knew the whole process of it. So it was coming to a point where I didn't really need, need to go to Google or CSS Tricks or anything like that to actually figure out what I'm doing. I understand how to make layouts and all this other stuff. 
But the more I was doing it, the more I was like, I'm getting kind of bored. It was like the same thing over and over and again. And I was like, is there some, is there a reason why like it's boring right now? Like I said, it was a lot of redundancy. Since I was working by myself, um, I just did whatever I wanted to do. And when the developers actually looked at my code, they were like, what the hell are you doing? And I was like, I don't know, I'm just Googling stuff and just making it look good. So, so my coding buzz started to wear off and I was like, I need something else. I was like, what's next? So I was like, kind of thinking, I was talking to some of the developers. He's like, yeah, you should try JavaScript. I was like, okay, because HTML, CSS was conquered, and I was like, I guess this is the next drug of choice, right? But something happened. We didn't mix <laughs> at all. I didn't understand. I was like, I was trying to figure it out, but I couldn't figure it out at all. It was kind of like oil and water, or Batman and Joker, or New York or Boston. <laughs> I know a couple people from Boston here, so yeah. <laughs> so there was four main reasons why it didn't actually work. Um, first was understanding the syntax. It was definitely a big learning curve for me since I was more of a traditional designer. I had no CS background, no coding background, so it was kind of harder for me to understand. Um, second was definitely a, a different, uh, different thinking process because if you think about it, you have to account for many situations, whereas in the CSS, what I was doing before was pretty, pretty much upfront. Um, the docs are very heavy. I, I'll look at the docs and I'll like fall asleep and I was like, oh God. So, and also I tried like many educational platforms like Linda, uh, Code Academy, all this stuff, and it didn't stick. It didn't stick because most of the time they'll teach you the syntax, but not how to think about it. So when I tried to do my own projects, I was like, I was stuck. I didn't know where to start. So this made me very frustrated and sad. And I was like, I don't know what else I'm gonna do. Um, and it was really interesting because once I started going to meetups just trying to get better and stuff like that, and people was like, oh yeah, you're having trouble with this, like, you should try like SAS. I was like, I was like what is, what's this thing called SAS? And I was like, and they were talking about like, it's basically CSS with superpowers. And I was like, whoa, I want some superpowers. I was like, <laughs> I wanna be part of that. So um, I started, um, and the most interesting thing about it was that uh, SAS was kind of like a presentation language with basically um, scripting language capabilities. So with the SAS script, you could do many things that you could do the same thing within um, JavaScript and any other object learning language. So the problems are solved. Now my code is kind of dry now. I was like, okay, I'm kind of feeling this. I was able to break down my, my, my folder, my um, CSS folders because I used to work with a big, large style, that CSS folder where it was like trying to find things. It was like a hot mess. Like I was finding and replacing different stuff and then it will mess up other stuff. And it made my code more scalable. So this leads you to the next stage, which is basically regular use. I started using it regularly. I was like, any side project I had, I started using SAS. I was like, yeah, I'm starting to like it. And I was like, it came to a point where I just couldn't go back to CSS. Even if I had to produce CSS, I would just go somewhere, I do use a SAS Meister where I could just do my SAS, compile, and then everything's there for me to just copy and paste in. And also, it was so good that it just kind of made me lazy, actually, because it was like, it has all these, all these things that make your life easier, such as uh, pattern frameworks like Bourbon, Compass, which is great for um, vendor prefixes and all that other stuff, um, which you probably don't need anymore. But we have these grid systems, which um, I use uh, Suzy, and I, I love it because it removes, you don't have to actually change classes within the markup to actually um, change the layout, which was pretty awesome for me. Um, and if you want to check out more, uh, check out um, Sashay for more uh, sassy stuff. It's like a whole bunch of things out there. But, like with anything, with great power comes with great responsibilities. That's from Spider-Man, if you don't know, Uncle Ben. Uh, <laughs> my favorite quote. But the thing I was doing that I was kind of, kind of overusing it. Like I was doing too much with it. 
I didn't know how to stop because I was just so hooked and I was like, I just got to keep on going. So this is the next stage, which is substance abuse or SAS abuse, either way. Um, so the first one was uh, kind of, it's kind of funny because uh, for me, I thought you want your CSS to appear just like your markup, right? Is that a, that's a good idea, right? So you end up with the nesting inception. But this wasn't a good idea. And why wasn't it a good idea? Because your, 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 your CSS is not componentized right now. And I didn't just go one, two, three, four, five, six level deeps. I went eight levels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So basically what I was building, I was building pages instead of actual components, and it came to a point where I had, it was like, for my actual personal website, so it was like 14 big pages that was there. So I was thinking, I was like, oh, damn, that's a learn, right? And I was like, oh, maybe I should refactor it, but it was just so much work, and I was like, I, was like, I don't have time for this. I was like... It was, it was so much work, and I was like, you know what? This gives me, gives me another reason, why, um, reason to actually build my website again. So that's what I did. Um, the second overdose episode was, I call it the Extend Burgers. This is where your extends kind of look like this. I mean, your, your selectors is just extend after extend after extend after extend. Interestingly enough, um, I thought extends is actually the faster way of doing it, but it's not. Um, there's a great article from Shay from um, Belly talking about um, mixins versus extends and extends. I mean, mixins won um, by a mile because they were actually simple to use, um, faster to load, and then they're also creating the smallest file size. And also, it's also easier to debug with mixins than actual extends that I found. And also, I was actually using a lot of important, which is not a good thing. So don't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing was the overusing SAS itself. I think sometimes when you're writing SAS, you forget that it's CSS and not JavaScript. So I don't know if you can see that. But when it starts looking like this, and especially for someone that doesn't know SAS, you're going to look and it's like, wait, is, am I in the right file? <laughs> Even to this day, I don't know what this does. but. <laughs> it does whatever I want to do, so whatever. So that was one. Uh, those are the three problems. So after I kind of figured out, you know, my overdoses, and I was like, all right, I know what to do now. Stage four. It was a full addiction now. It was a full addiction right now because um, I was using so much that I couldn't go back. And every time I see a design, I was like, hmm, I wonder how to do that in SAS or how to make any way where it's just scalable and you don't have to write that much code. And I was like, I need to do it all the time. I was like, I was fiending for it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> so what happens if, if you just have sass in your head and your blood and it's like, oh, I, need, I need something else. Sass. It brings me to the, number, uh, the first benefit, which is basically how SAS introduced pro, um, program concepts to um, designers. Like I said before, I had trouble learning JavaScript, but once I started to get familiar with SAS, it was just kind of easy, because it, it has the same concepts, where it has variables. Mind you, it's different, different um, syntax, but it's the same idea. We have arrays, which are lists in SAS. We have objects, which is maps in um, SAS, we have functions, and we have loops. So now I had a good understanding of how to make my uh, work with JavaScript now. So I started experimenting with jQuery first, and then, then I started getting my feet um, wet with actual JavaScript, which is more of like conditional and programming and all this other stuff. And with these two tools, it was very easy to actually design and implement your designs very quickly. Um, at NASDAQ, that's what uh, most of our team does. Our, most of our designers know how to code with HTML, CSS, and then JavaScript. And we do this thing called rapid prototyping. Rapid prototyping is basically, in a gist, when you design something in your application, you validate, 
with uh, team of designers, developers, and stakeholders. The process is iterative. You basically do the, um, three steps. Why, um, you basically do three um, steps, which is prototype, refine, prototype, review, and refine. See, with this is that sometimes your design is not right at the first try. You have to keep on designing and designing and testing it out with your users to see if it works. It's like if I buy a pair of jeans, I, must, I probably want to try it on before I actually buy them. Because if I commit to them and they don't fit, then that's a problem. So that was kind of like the um, story we were trying to solve. Um, benefit number three, like I said, it's a definitely a great um, tool for today's designers. Most people believe that uh, designers can't, shouldn't be able to do use SAS or JavaScript, but I think it's now more than ever that our job responsibilities is it's so much that we need to actually design the actual product close to the product as much as possible. And we should probably design and test our, 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 our interactions. And why it makes it easier? Because now we have to test for different screen size, resolutions, browsers. Now we have like the, I, the iWatch and all this other stuff. So we have so many devices and situations to design for. We have to test for the user, uh, user interaction, which is why most of our team um, uses JavaScript, because it, it does click um, events and feedbacks, which you can't do just with CSS. Um, and also, um, comes with things called visual conditionals, which is basically um, a way to set uh, um, conditionals for when different designs activate. And like I said before, it makes the designers focus on um, interaction over visual design, especially when uh, we work in sprints. You don't really have time to actually focus on you know, how the type, the type looks, how, what color to use. There should be something in place for that. Uh, cool. Uh, the benefit, it improves communication and collaboration within your team. So as we, in NASDAQ, we have 30 uh, people in our product design team. Uh, we have about six, seven product owners and at least 40 developers. So it's, if we didn't know how to code or, or do any prototyping, it would be hard to actually um, communicate our ideas to us. So, being that we have all these skills, the benefits to designers is that now we can set up design frameworks like Pattern Library and Style Guy, which um, basically um, keeps the design consistent itself. So, when you're actually designing, you don't have, you don't have to actually um, spend your time thinking about it. You could just reference to the Pattern Library Style Guy, and that will help you out. And also, it benefits the developers too. Because now you speak their language, you understand their, their, their constraints. Um, it's less deliverables. I know for me, I used to do mock-ups and then do annotation, which I hated. I was like, I don't want to type words. I just want to code and stuff like that. <laughs> but um, this was a, a good thing just to deliver some uh, actual prototype to them. And it also gives them freedom to design too. Cause most developers won't admit, but they kind of like designing too. So you give them the tools, style guide, you give them a pattern library, sometimes they come back to you and they're like, yo, I got this, what do you think about this? I was like, oh, I thought you didn't say you like the code. Now you know. And they will love you. They will give you a big kiss like that. <laughs> um, benefits too for the stakeholders. Um, I think it's very uh, important to have actual working prototype. And a prototype is different from a, a static mockup because a prototype actually includes both interaction and it tries to include uh, real data too, which I think is important just for testing on the market, especially for usability testing, which we, which what we do in NASDAQ. And also, when you come to a meeting, it's a great presentation tool. So usually you send this out before before the actual meeting. And what they will do is they will play around with it and then they will have a set of questions when they come to the meeting, which makes the meeting more efficient rather than having a two, three hour meeting. They ask the right questions too. So it's not about how it looks or is that 
font too big or they need, it needs more splash or whatever like that. It's more about is it answering the right question. Uh, it also gives an ability to see, uh, see any uh, pitfalls in the ideas because I know when you're designing it, you're focused on one thing, but you got to think about it. You're, whatever you, you design is a, a reflection of the whole product itself. So teamwork makes the dream work. It makes you happy. <laughs> uh, I think I started at NASDAQ, and I, it's kind of funny because even it took me a while just to get used to actually um, showing unfinished work, and that's one of the benefits of actual um, showing a prototype. It gives them the ability to actually test it out, and it's, it's interesting that most, um, if you include them in, in the process itself, people will uh, get excited about what they're doing, and basically you all in, basically you're all in the same team, because I know um, in some companies where there's definitely beef between the designers, the developers, and the product owners, and, but you have to understand that if the product does well, everyone wins. So I'm actually going to stop kind of short, but the takeaways hopefully you get is that uh, how SAS introduced um, programming language to um, concepts. I think now for me, I don't only consider myself a designer developer, I consider myself a prototyper, which is I think uh, uh, an interesting role since now I'm more focusing on if what I'm designing makes sense. So I'm able to validate uh, my, di my design uh, decisions. Also, it improves co uh, collaboration and communication within the team itself, which I think is very important. Um, working, with, working at NASDAQ actually taught me how like, you have to be patient with everyone because um, sometimes you can't just do whatever you want, which is probably best. Some resources. Um, Definitely check out sasslang.com, sasway. Uh, those is great tutorials for um, basically advanced beginners and anyone in between. Um, SASMaster is a great uh, application where you can actually write your SAS and see how it compiles into um, TSS, which is a, a good um, thing to know about. Um, we have SAS Bytes, which is a great podcast where um, that's on YouTube. And also, there's a lot of people in the community like Hampton. Um, Chris Epstein, uh, Claudina, uh, Sam Richard, Scott Kellum, follow them on Twitter. Um, yeah, and thanks for listening. Questions? Thank you.